for attending this 8.30 on a Monday after a week's long holiday. How was your holiday? Good. Uh, very good holiday. Man, I'm getting, nobody, nobody hated the fact they had a week off, right? No. You didn't? No, uh, well, that's, uh, that's probably something inherent to your personality, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying it's wrong or bad or anything, but, you know, not the common experience. Probably, anyway. So, anyway, um, I guess the uh, elephant in the room that we should address at this point is what the hell's going on with the midterm. Um, I basically, at this point, um, we have to finish the material on priority queues because um, the midterm, basically, it's going to be... Uh, chapters one and two out of the textbook, which is the preliminary stuff that we covered, you know, big O, union find, all that stuff, plus all of the sorting algorithms. And that's kind of where we're going to draw the line for the midterm. So we haven't quite caught up to where that line is being drawn with respect to testable material. So I'm having to push the midterm back by a week. Um, I have no idea how last year the professor who was teaching this course taught all of this material in the timeline that was ascribed. It just, it boggles. Like, I don't think I've been, like, have I been slacking? You know? I think I've, we've been moving through at a pretty good clip. You know? Um, at least, I, I always like to, like, make sure that people's questions get answered and that people at least have some faint glimmer of understanding in their faces before we move on to the next topic. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, at this point, the, um, the degree to which we are behind, like we're at least a full week behind, probably a week and a half behind. So unfortunately, that means I'm probably going to have to cut some material at the end of the course. Uh, but, you know, I kind of feel like as long as we give a good coverage of graph algorithms, that's probably our, uh, you know, even if we have to run through string algorithms in a somewhat more cursory fashion, if we can just like solidly cover searches and graphs, I think we're we'll have like, completed our learning objectives for this course, if that makes sense. Um, certainly, by this point, you should already be absorbing like, the thing that you're actually supposed to take from this course, which is you know, the thing that'll stay with you after you've forgotten all of the specifics of the algorithms we've talked about, which is algorithmic thinking, right? You have to be able to think in terms of runtime complexity. Like, just look at an algorithm and say, bad, or good, you know? You have to develop an intuitive sense. But, um, but yeah, so with respect to the midterm, unfortunately, I don't have a time slot for you yet. I need to talk to bookings about it. Uh, it's kind of highly dependent on what's going on with the, uh, with, you know, I need to get a room booked. Shouldn't be too difficult, though, because, like, this is going to be a paper test rather than a laptop test, so that means we can write in almost any room on campus, uh, as long as it's sufficiently sized. So, you know, that should, I should be able to, uh, to grab a, a room reasonably easily. I will try to, like, uh, I'll try to see if I can finagle something sort of end of the weeky on the Thursday or the Friday. Um, is that, uh, is that suitable? You guys have any other big midterms in that, in that bracket? You know, aside from mine. Okay. Oh. Um, Monday, Tuesday. Fine from Thursday, Friday. Okay. Cool. And are you like, uh, are you top side? Yeah. Okay. Not that, not that I, uh, not that I privilege the opinions of comp sci uh, majors in this, you know, comp sci class or anything, but. Uh, um, yeah, good. Any any questions, comments, concerns about that before we uh, yes? But to be fair, like you're saying like we're we're behind by a week. All of our courses are behind by a week. It's like every single CS course that we have right now, all of our times have been pushed back at least like a week or two. That's interesting. Well, I guess I'm in good company then. One MD three's on track. I'm pretty impressed about that. Oh one one MD three? Yeah, but uh, you know, they're taking that one away from me next semester anyway. Wait, wait, what? Yeah. Wait, no more one MD3 more? Yeah, no, it's uh, Dr. Machio is going to be teaching it next semester. Oh, no. Oh. Oh. But, uh, anyway. I'm not going to come. 
But fortunately, you've already passed it, so you don't have to worry. <laughs> so, I would hope. So um, let's let's uh, let's let's learn stuff and stuff. Um, so, are there any sort of any other sort of administrate? Oh, assignment two is getting released today. Just so you know. Um, <laughs> You know, just in case you thought you had a moment's reprieve, uh, you did, and that moment has passed. So, um, any other like uh, administrative uh, questions before we uh, move along with the material? Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so recapping quickly my own lecture video from uh, from last time. It looked like we like just kissed the surface of priority queues without really getting into any of the math. And then I gave a heap sort demonstration, which was kind of out of order because we don't really get to heap sort until you know quite a bit further on in this very lecture theory, uh, this lecture. I'll redo the heap heap sort example and not screw the math up this time. Um, but yeah, um, it was like five minutes left. Might as well do the demo, you know. I'll do it again. So, anyway, my, since it's been a week, we might as well take it from the top, considering we didn't really uh, get too far into it anyway. So, for a number of weeks, we've been kind of in algorithms land without really having to consider very much about data structures, per se. Um, Pretty much all of the sorting algorithms that we've talked about uh, over the foregoing weeks have been operations on arrays. We have just had this one singular data structure and we were focusing on different ways of arranging things inside of that data structure with the same end result. We are now back, uh, conceptually speaking, we're now closer to union find land than uh, we have been in uh, sorting land for the last few weeks, we're now considering the data structure to be an integral part of the algorithm. Uh, the arrangement of the data is going to become a very important game. Um, this is because we are introducing a new type of data structure called the binary heap. Um, binary heaps are binary trees with particular properties applied to them. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's kind of like uh, how a doubly linked list is a type of linked list with an additional property that's been applied to it. It's kind of in that same conceptual category, right? So, um, you know, that's, that's one important thing that you should also take from uh, this class and a more formal understanding of data structures is the arrangements of data described by data structures, right? The names that we call these arrangements of data can be subsets of each other, right? All binary heaps are binary trees. Not all binary trees are binary heaps. Make sense? These are the types of like categories that we're now dealing with. So the question that we're, um, the question that we need to motivate things from, of course, is, okay, so he's talked about this new type of data structure we're going to learn about. To what end? Right? What is the operation that we're trying to optimize for in this particular instance? Well, in this particular instance, we are talking about the ability to quickly and easily extract the maximum or minimum value from a set of data, um, hopefully in constant time. So, we are going to develop a data structure which always places the maximum value in that data structure at a fixed position inside of the data structure. And from there, we're going to organize the data in such a manner that it makes it easy to find the next maximum after we've, you know, extracted and removed the previous maximum. Does that make sense? This is what we're optimizing for right now. So applications of uh, priority queues are, you know, there are quite a few of them, you know. 
if you imagine, um, you know, imagine waiting in line at the uh, at the Ministry of Transportation office to get your uh, to get your G license or something like that, right? Take a number, right? A bunch of customers all have a number, right? That's that's a that's a that's a that's a minimum priority queue, right? Because it's whoever's got the smallest number in in they get served next, right? A similar process on, uh, goes on with operating systems. One uh, process scheduling algorithm that you will likely talk about in fourth year is uh, well, you'll talk about the various ways to uh, schedule processes inside of uh, you know. Which process does the operating, surf, uh, operating system serve first, right? Um, one such algorithm is earliest deadline first, which is a pretty good one. Um, it has pretty good performance characteristics. And that is a minimization problem on remaining time until de deadline, right? So keeping tasks stored inside of a, a priority queue, that's a good thing. Um, and, uh, you know, later when we talk about graphs, we will talk about Dijkstra's algorithm. I think we're going to also talk about Prim's algorithm, so um, we'll get there when we get there. But, uh, so, the API that we're talking about with priority queues is relatively simple. We're only really concerned about the insert and the delete max functions. The other ones are basically just, you know, return some property without actually doing anything to the data structure. Um, like, for example, um, key max returns the largest key. That doesn't actually modify the data structure. And if it is true what I have said, that we always have the maximum in a fixed position, that is literally just reading uh, some array in index, right? Um, and I just gave away that the, uh, the data structure underlying the data structure is again going to be an array. Alright? Any questions so far? Good. Um, so, again, insert and delete are our big things that we're interested in. So, so we're now that we've talked about sorting algorithms um, quite a bit, we can recognize that an unordered array has certain fundamental differences to an ordered array. Right? It makes like a big part of programming, sort of in a very general sense is knowing what properties your data conforms to and making use of those properties to reduce your runtime, right? Where's the maximum located in a sorted array? At the end. Or at the beginning, yes, but it's either at the beginning or at the end, right? Um, where's the maximum in an unsorted array? Anywhere, absolutely. So, in order to find the maximum in an unordered array, that is a linear time algorithm, right? Whereas in an ordered array, that is, uh, that is a constant time algorithm. With respect to inserting an element, you know you can also make the argument that uh, in an ordered array you can use binary search to find the position that you want to insert something in. But remember that arrays are stored in contiguous memory. So, if you want to insert something into an array, you have to shift the entire rest of the array down, right? Which means, at most, n copy operations. So, while the finding of the position uh, is rightly, you know, if you're doing it intelligently and using binary search, um, that is a log n operation. The actual insertion of it physically into the memory, that is still linear. Make sense? So, our goal is to reduce both of these to log n operations. So, we're going to try to split the difference between constant time and logarithmic time. And, of course, 
you know, logarithmic time is much, 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 much better than linear time. So we come out on top by splitting the difference. Make sense? Any questions? Not so far. So the binary or maximum heap ordered tree is a complete binary tree where the keys are in the nodes and every parent's key is greater than its children's keys. This is the max heap property. So first of all, uh, what's a complete binary tree? Yeah? Where every parent has two children nodes? Um, I, like you're you're half right. Yes. Is it when like all the levels of the tree have the nodes starting from left to right? Yes, and all rows except for the last one are filled. Yeah. Right. So uh, a complete binary tree is a binary tree in which there are no sort of half empty branches. Right. Um, this is the type of tree that we will construct uh, by design. Right. So. We've already departed from the binary tree, which is a more general model. A bi in a binary tree, you're allowed to have branches missing, right? In this, we are constraining it to be a complete binary tree, right? But it's not considered a binary heap unless it satisfies the binary heap property. The bi so the binary heap property for every node in the tree, if that node has children, those children have a lesser value than the parent. So where's the maximum? At the top, or the root node, right? So if you uh, sort of follow that reasoning inductively, that means that the, um, the root node must have the highest value of any node in the tree because, of course, um, in theory, we're operating on a numerical system where the transitive property applies to ordering relations. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the math way of saying that if A is less than B and uh, B is less than C, then uh, C is also greater than A, right? Incidentally, as you go on in, uh, in formal mathematics, you'll find that there exist, or there theoretically exist, numerical systems in which that property does not hold. Uh, you can have partially ordered sets where uh, the transitive property of ordering relations does not hold, um, which are terrible, and, uh, you know, hopefully you don't have to see them or work with them until grad school. But uh, just so you know, there was one in my compiler for my thesis, so they do actually apply to things. Um, so, and any questions about my thesis will have to be asked after the course is over. Uh, <laughs> so, so we have this tree structure, right? However, I said that we would be storing it in an array, so it requires a, uh, a certain amount of, um, oh, I'm sorry, you have a question? Yeah, um, I was just curious, would it be like, like all these kinds of like CSC? So, say a little louder, please. What if the time of let's say is deleting the root node of dn? We'll get there, but no, it's log n. We'll see. Um, the insert, uh, we're just about to get there. We're just about to get there. Um, so, first let's, let's talk about how this thing is actually stored in memory, right? So, Uh, you know, whenever we talk about any of these data structures, they'll always be illustrated, be, you know, using integers or characters. But please, like, a better way to think of these are like identification numbers on records in a database or something like that, right? Um, you know, these are real-world situations. So the way that we take a binary heap and store it in an array, first of all, we leave the first num we leave the first spot in the array blank 
because uh, basically for the problem, uh, we require multiplication in order to you know, jump around inside of this thing. So if we start from zero, that screws the math up and the formulas become a lot less nice. So we just start from one, even if we're in a zero index system. It's not that big a loss usually, <laughs> if that makes sense. Does that make sense? So we're starting our numbering from one here because it makes the math work more nicely. Um, so the root is in position one. The children of the root are in positions two and three. The, chil the uh, nodes at the second level, or sorry, at the third level, use positions four through seven, right? So essentially, if you were to have, um, you know, I'm just gonna make a quick tree. I hope this is like identifiable as a tree. Is this reasonably identifiable as a tree? Yeah? Okay. The way that this gets stored in memory, right? You take this node here, take that node there, put them there, take these nodes, put them there, take these nodes, put them there, and that's how you store it in memory. Make sense? This has some interesting consequences. It means that for any node inside of the binary heap, the positions of the child nodes are relatable to the position of the parent node via a mathematical formula, specifically the one that's up on the slides right now. So the, the, uh, the two children of any node k are at positions 2k and 2k plus 1, right? So, for example, if I were to take node 1, 2k and 2k plus 1 are 2 and 3. If I were to take 3, 2k is 6, and 2k plus 1 is 7, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. These two are these guys, children. Make sense? And so, in the same way, you can trace back up the tree by simply dividing your current index by 2 and taking the floor of that. So dropping the 0.5 if a 0.5 occurs, right? So if I have, you know, position 10, right, the, um, the uh, parent node of that will be at position 5. I think, wait. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, yeah. So there we go. And, uh, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, that's correct, because that one will take these two. This one will take these two. Yeah, that's correct. All right. Math, math still works. Um, good. So, <clears throat> so this is actually, uh, it may not seem like it, but this is actually a critical property for runtime. Um, It means that all of, your, uh, all of your child and parent nodes can be found in one step from each other, right? Um, so to go, f you know, to trace from the bottom of this tree to the top all the way, only, well, in theory, if you know how far you're jumping, you can just perform multiple calculations all at once, right? But if you were to, you know, Perform an operation, go to the parent, perform the operation, go to the parent, etc., etc., all the way up to the root node. How many nodes would you be going through on a, on a, on a tree with n nodes? Log n. Exactly. Because when we have a binary tree, right, the height of that binary tree is log n, right? Since we have now changed things so that the path through the data structure is proportional to the height of the tree, and the height of the tree is at most, yeah, uh, or is, is exactly log n, because this is all constrained to be a complete binary tree, then, you know, we're starting to get to territory where we can see where a log n runtime might be coming from, right? 
Make sense so far? Good. Any questions? Good. So, before we talk about insertion, I, I appreciate that you'd like to get there, but let's, let's talk about one more thing before we get there. Let's talk about initialization. All right? So, when you're just given data, that data will not necessarily conform to the binary heap property. It is necessary to impose that property on data if you're just given data and, you know, asked to do something with it, right? So you have one of two options, right? You have, you either start with a uh, empty binary tree and then you perform repeated insertion operations, or you apply the binary tree pro or the bi yeah the binary heap property directly to the nodes as they currently sit, which might require less uh, you know less changing things depending on whether or not the uh, depending on how close it is already to a binary heap, right? So. So we have to talk about how we might go about maintaining the sortedness, or the, not, the binary heap property, which is a, a type of sorting. So the problem that we have, right, what will cause the binary heap property not to hold, right? Well, the binary heap property is that all parents must be greater than their children. If we have a child that's greater than its parent, then we have a problem. That violates the binary heap property. So what do we do? What do we do anytime something's out of order? We swap them, right? So, essentially, with the binary heaps, we have two um, styles of this swap operation called sinking and swimming, right? So you swim things up and you sink things down. But it's very simple, you know? Let's talk about swimming things up first. So let's imagine we had, you know, a very simple one. Um, yes, that'll do. So, if we have a binary heap consisting of only three items, you'll notice that this six is a child greater than the five, which is the parent. So, you swim it up. Right? So, <coughs> this is all well and good. It's a, it's a little bit more complicated to um, swim things down, because you have to make a decision, right? Each of these, uh, every child node will have exactly one parent, right? But each parent will have at most, and pro most probably, two children. So the question is, which of those two do you select, right? So, Go. We exchange the parents with the larger child, right? So the problem that you run into, the, the problem that needs to be addressed with respect to the binary heap is that there's no sorting relation which is implied by the structure of the algorithm on children, on the child number. Right? Um, and I think this is the problem that I had with my demonstration two weeks ago. So let's just, let's imagine that we're, uh, let's imagine that we're in this situation again, right? If we're concerned with going from the top down rather than the bottom up, right? We have one of these two to select for, right? There, it's not like we're keeping big ones on the left and small ones on the right. 
We will eventually be doing that when we talk about uh, binary search trees. But for now, there's no ordering relation implied between these two. These can be here, they can be there, whatever. Right? Most critically, it is, it is well possible to promote the wrong one. Right? Like if we imagined if we had a slightly different situation, uh, like, like this one, where both of these guys would uh, result in satisfactory exchanges from the perspective of the, this parent node, right? You can, um, if you swap this one, basically, put the six up here, that's correct because the binary heap property is maintained for both children. But if you swap this way, it looks like you're doing a good thing, right? Because if you're only examining these two nodes, it looks like you're maintaining the heap property, but you're not if you look at the other child, right? So, in order to maintain the binary heap property, you don't just select willy-nilly. You have to select the maximum of the two children to go into the maximal position. Make sense? Good. So that's, that's sinking and swimming. Um, basically, if you take that and you follow the, uh, you sort of, if you take that swapping operation, the way that gets extended to sinking or swimming is you select a node of concern, which might possibly be, you know, out of place with respect to the data structure, right? And then you follow it through a series of swap operations, either starting at the extremity of the tree and moving up towards the root, or starting at the root and moving down towards the leaves, right? Swimming it up towards the root, sinking it down towards the leaves, right? But you follow the path of, it's, it's a little bit like bubble sort, actually, if you apply bubble sort to a, to a tree. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. So. Yeah. Good. Yes. If the key is larger than the parent's key, it violates the binary heap property. To eliminate the violation, exchange the child's position with its parent. Repeat until order is restored. So now that we know, we can now that we know about all of this, we can finally answer our question about insertion, right? New nodes in a binary heap are always inserted into whichever position still makes that binary tree a complete binary tree, right? That property must be maintained through insertion. So. If we have a somewhat simple binary tree, or a binary heap, I, I'm sorry. I know, sometimes when I watch back the lectures, I notice that I like say the wrong word, and like don't notice that I say the wrong word. Like I'll confuse binary tree and heap. So if I do that, please just put your hand up and correct me for the purposes of the video, because it's like you know, just terrible. But uh, anyway. <laughs> Um, so if we have a binary tree with a few items missing, in order to insert more items, we have to do that in a specific order to maintain completeness. You have to put them into the last rank and, you know, from right to left, or left to right, whichever one you're doing. Right? So, the problem that you have is that, well, first let me see that this is a complete. Uh, there we go. Binary heap property established. Good. So, if we were to insert some new element, randomly a one, not, uh, four, four will do, there's only one position that it can be put in, right? Right here. The next thing that you have to do is you have to swim that up to its correct position inside of the tree, right? So we identify our node of interest, 
We perform the swap examination. In this particular case, we've got uh, the binary heap property violated. So we perform the swap. We are now examining this guy, comparing it to its parent. This is not in violation of the binary heap property, so we can stop swimming. Again, because Anything past that, you know, if you imagine this as a node of a larger tree, the root, yeah, root of a larger tree, anything past this node has to also be greater so long as the binary heap property applies to everything else in the tree, right? So you know you can stop there. Once you hit one thing you're not greater than, you can stop. Make sense? So the number of operations that you have to perform to get that node into its correct position is at most the height of the tree, which means it's at most log n, right? In all likelihood, you'll be able to stop after, you know, probably two or three swaps, depends on the size of the data structure, right? Certainly in the types of examples you see in this class, you know, if you have like millions of items, it's a different story, of course, but you know, so it goes. Does that make sense? Question? Is the tree considered not complete if, like, R and S are on two different branches. Like I, I don't exactly understand like why certain letters belong to the left and certain letters belong to the right. Like, or does it matter? It doesn't. Okay. Um, that's an excellent question. Thank you for the question. The question is, um, how is it that it how is it decided which letters go on the left, which letters go on the right? Right? Um, the answer is that it's completely arbitrary. The binary heap does not care about the ordering between the children. Right? That's another way of saying that, right? Um, once we get into uh, binary search trees, which we're going to do in not too much time, we will, in fact, start to worry about what the child nodes are doing. For the moment, we are only interested in parental supremacy. All right? We, the only property that we are trying to maintain at the moment is that the parent has a greater value than both of its children, right? So everything, like, that's why the child, the, uh, you know, the values of the children kind of seem a little bit random. Uh, it's because it's dependent on the manner in which the, like, it's highly dependent on the order in which things were added to the, to the heap, right? In the same way that, like, if you guys remember with uh, union find, the fact of connectedness will be maintained no matter how the nodes get added, or no matter how the connections get added to the union find, right? But, like, the particular appearance of the branches in the tree depends very highly on the order in which the connections are added, right? They tell the same story, but they will do so from differently arranged data structures depending on how things are added. Make sense? Good. Um, that kind of makes these lazy algorithms. Um, eager algorithms are things that put data into order in advance of it being needed, right? Lazy algorithms only do, do only as much as required uh, in order to order things. Um, and lazy algorithms, turns out, are a lot of the time better. <laughs> so, uh, not that laziness is better. Laziness in a computer algorithm can be virtuous. Laziness in a human being is never virtuous. So, um, good. So, now that we've talked about the insert operation, we can also talk about the deletion operation, which, as we recall, the, those would be our two primary operations taken care of. All right? So, with respect to, and uh, you know what, I'm going to make this tree a little bit bigger. Let's just, uh, two, one, one. Missing one here. Uh, three. There we go. All right. Binary. That's binary. 
So, um, good. So we are also concerned with being able to remove the maximum value, right? We don't want to just tell what the maximum is. You know, if your customer with the with the uh, lowest ticket number has been served, you want to remove them from the queue so that you can tell who the next one is, right? So. This is the procedure for deletion, right? The maximum element is always in a known position. It's always in position one, right? So you can always know where to remove it from, right? The question is, what do you do with it once you've removed it, right? So we make one decision here. Uh, as to where we're going to put it, which, um, let's say, it seems a little arbitrary now, but once we get into heap sort, it will make perfect sense. We actually take the maximum, and you know, if you want to read the maximum, you can also read the maximum, but with respect to just removing it, we actually perform a swap and swap it with the element at the end of the array. All right? We no longer consider this to be inside of the binary tree, or inside of the binary heap. It's just on its own now. The heap, the heap stops here now, because you know, that would obviously violate the, the heap property. So the question we now have is, we now have, you know, this is most probably not going to be satisfying the binary heap property unless you have constructed a binary tree to hold all of the same number, like, you know, just a heap of sevens um, or something like that. So, what we do with this guy now is we sync him down to his correct position inside the data structure. So we're now using the opposite direction operation. This is our node of interest, and we're going to trace the path through the tree. So, our first decision, um, Yellow or green, which one do we swap for? Green. Yep, there we go. Um, blue or blue, which do we swap for? <laughs> we go for the three because it's greater. And then we've got one and two. We swap for the two. There we go. Again, a log n operation. Right? So, we have a data structure where both insertion and deletion are now logarithmic time al uh, sub-algorithms. We have accomplished the goal. Make sense? Any questions? Yes? So in this pseudocode, what is n in this pseudocode? What is n in this pseudocode? Um, that would be the number of elements uh, in the data structure itself. That's going to have to be separately maintained, particularly if you're in a language like C, which doesn't, re like doesn't recognize the size of its own data structures. Right? So basically, you just keep a separate counter variable inside of the uh, class, you know, if it's something that supports classes. Um, you know, incremented anytime you insert, decremented anytime you remove, and that will tell you what the end position of the, uh, of the uh, binary heap inside the array is. And that way, everything's fine. Everything's good. You know where to look in constant time, right? Obviously, finding the end of the array is going to be a linear time algorithm if you're not keeping track of it. So that's why we spend a little, uh, spend a little memory to get a lot of runtime. Make sense? Any other questions? Yes, sir. Ah, so um, if I reverse these swaps, right, um, because of the binary heap property, if we always select the maximum of the two children, then it's always a correct parent for the other side as well, 
So you don't have to backtrack. No, no, my question is like, which, how do we know which uh, factors in it? Is it right or the left one? Uh, whichever is greater, that's the one you choose. Yeah, but like, we need to like, compare this one that way. Right? Yes. So that will take some time to. Yeah, but the time that takes is does not like it's not proportional to the size of the data structure, right? That comparison gets made in constant time because the position of both child nodes are known mathematically from the position of the parent node. We don't have to search for them. Right. Make sense? Question. Um, Um, well, most two log two. So every time you perform one sync operation, you're performing two sets of comparisons, right? The first set of comparisons you're performing is to see if this if the child node is out of place, right? The second is to compare which of these two you want to swap it for. So that means that at most you've got two uh, log, it, log base 2n, uh, even though we usually throw the two off and, and call it big O. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Cool. So, um, yep, good, 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 cost uh, summary. So, there are some ways that binary heaps can be practically improved. Um, fun fact, the height of a complete D-way tree of n nodes is log base D of n. So, you know, if you, uh, if you had four nodes at each level, then you could, you know, the height of the tree shortens considerably, right? Um, so, in, term, in terms of practicality, like obviously, you know, the 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 uh, the way that you pay for that, right, uh, is your um, your number of comparisons is the square of the number of of child nodes per parent node, right? So, in order, like, because ba basically. In order to sync a node into the correct position, you need to find the, na the maximum of all of the child nodes, right? So that's, in, that's, um, you know, that's linear on the number of child nodes. Linear, sorry, not, not, not quadratic. But, so that's, you pay for that that way. Whereas if you know, like if it's always only two, then you, that's always only one comparison that you have to do to find the maximum, right? So, you know, to a degree, but you know, there's a reason that binary trees are overwhelmingly dominant for you know, yeah, you know, various reasons, right? Make sense? Okay. In the one minute that's remaining, I will just say what heap sort is and does, and then we can get out of here. I'll give the demo next time, obviously. So, if you have a binary heap and you Procedurally, delete, uh, perform the delete maximum operation n times. That is to say, you delete every node in the tree. Because we are always swapping the maximum to the end of the array, by the time you're finished that, you have a sorted array. And that's heap sort. Make sense? I'll give you a demonstration next time. Thank you very much.